Hello and welcome to Goodnight Flagstaff. I am Margarita Bauza. Thank you for tuning in to our community story time. We have some exciting news. We're almost done with the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which makes it a good time to make our podcast even better. Starting next week, you'll be able to find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher. You'll still be able to find all of our previous recorded books on YouTube, and we hope to upload them to our new podcast channel as well. And of course, Creator Radio, our local online radio station. We'll still be playing the previous chapter each weeknight about 7.30, just before the new chapter airs. We're currently reading The Return of the King by J.R.R. Tolkien. If you'd like to check it out to read along with us at home, it is available at the library. Check one out today with your Coconino County Library card. Please email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with your community through stories. All ages are welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. Last time we read together, the Battle of Bywater was fought and won. Saruman was confronted at Bag End, where Wormtongue finally turned on his master and killed him, and hobbits in turn killed Wormtongue. That was the end of that, except now the hard work of rebuilding and planting lay before them. Book 6, Chapter 9, The Grey Havens The clearing up certainly needed a lot of work, but it took less time than Sam had feared. The day after the battle, Frodo rode to Michael, Michelle Delving and released the prisoners from the lock holes. One of the first that they found was poor Fredegar Boulder, fatty no longer. He had been taken when the ruffians smoked out a band of rebels that he led from their hidings up in the bracken boars by the hills of Skerry. You would have done better to come with us all. After all, poor old Fredegar, said Pippin, as he carried him out too weak to walk. He opened an eye and tried gallantly to smile. Who's this young giant with the loud voice, he whispered. Not little Pippin. What's your size and hats now? Then there was Lobelia, poor thing. She looked very old and thin when they rescued her from a dark and narrow cell. She insisted on hobbling out on her own two feet, on her own feet. And she had such a welcome and there was such clapping and cheering when she appeared, leaning on Frodo's arm but still clutching her umbrella that she was quite touched and drove away in tears. She had never in her life been popular before, but she was crushed, crushed by the news of Lotho's murder, and she would not return to Bag End. She gave it back to Frodo and went to her own people, the brace girdles of Hardbottle. When the poor creature died next spring, she was after all more than a hundred years old. Frodo was surprised and much moved, she had left all that remained of her money and of Lotho's for him to use in helping hobbits make homeless, made homeless by troubles. So that feud was ended. Old Will Whitfoot had been in the lock holes longer than any and thought he had perhaps been treated less harshly than some. He needed a lot of feeding up before he could look the part of a mayor. So Frodo agreed to act as his deputy until Mr. Whitfoot was in shape again. The only thing that he did as deputy mayor was to reduce the sher sheriffs to their proper functions and numbers. The task of hunting out the last remnant of the ruffians was left to Mary and Pippin, and it was soon done. The southern gangs, after hearing the news of the Battle of Bywater, fled out of the land and offered little resistance to the Thane. Before the year's end, the few survivors were rounded up in the woods, and those that surrendered were shown to the borders. Meanwhile, the labor of repair went on apace, and Sam was kept very busy. Hobbits can work like bees when the mood and the need comes on them. Now there were thousands of willing hands of all ages, from the small but nimble ones of the hobbit lads and lasses to the well-worn and horny ones of the gaffers and gam gammers. Before Yule, not a brick was left standing to the new sheriff houses or of anything that had been built by Sharky's men, but the bricks were used to repair many an old hole to make it snugger and drier. Great stores of goods and food and beer were found had they, that had been hidden away by the ruffians in sheds and barns and deserted holes, and especially in the tunnels of Michelle Delving and in the old quarries at Scary, so that there was a great deal better cheer than you'll, that you will than anyone had hoped for. One of the first things done in Hobbiton 
before even the removal of the new mill was the clearing of the hill and bag end and the restoring of bagshot row. The front of the new sand pit was all leveled and made into a large sheltered garden and new holes were dug in the southward face back into the hill and they were lined with brick. The gaffer was restored to number three and he said often and did not care who heard it. It's an ill wind as blows nobody no good, as I always say, and all's well that ends as ends better. There was some discussion of the name that the new row should be given. Battle Gardens was thought of, or better smiles. But after a while, in sensible hobbit fashion, it was just called New Row. It was a purely bywater joke to refer to it as Sharky's End. The trees were the worst loss and damage for a Sharky's bidding, they had been cut down recklessly far and wide over the Shire. And Sam grieved over this more than anything else. For one thing, this hurt would take long to heal and only this great, his great grandchildren, he thought, would see the Shire as it ought to be. And suddenly one day, for he had been too busy for weeks to give a thought to his adventures, he remembered the gift of Galadriel. He brought the box out and showed it to the other travelers, for so they were now called by everyone, and asked their advice. I wonder when you think when you would think of it, said Frodo. Open it. Inside it was filled with gray dust, soft and fine, in the middle of which was a seed, like a small nut with a silver shale. What can I do with this? said Sam. Throw it in the air on a breezy day and let it do its work. Let it do its work, said Pippin. On what? said Sam. Choose one spot as a nursery and see what happens to the plants there, said Mary. But I'm sure the lady would not like me to keep it all for my own garden. Now so many folk have suffered, said Sam. Use all the wits and knowledge you have for your own, Sam, said Frodo, and then use the gift to help you your work and better it. And use it sparingly. There is not much here, and I expect every grain has value. So Sam planted saplings in all the places where Specially beautiful or beloved trees have been destroyed, and he put a grain of the precious dust in the soil at the root of each. He went up and down the shire in his labor, but if he paid special attention to Hobbiton by bywater and bywater, no one blamed him. And at the end, he found that he still had a little of the dust left. So he went to the, free, the three farthing stone, which is as near the center of the shire as no matter, and cast it in the air with his blessing. The little silver nut he planted in the party field where the tree had once been, and he wondered what would come of it. All through the winter, he remained as patient as he could and tried to restrain himself from good round constantly to see if anything was happening. Spring surpassed his wild hopes. His trees began to sprout and grow as if time was in a hurry and wished to make one year do for 20 in the party field, a beautiful young sapling leaped up. It had silver bark and long leaves and burst into golden flowers in April. It was indeed a malorn, and it was wonder. It was the wonder of the neighborhood. And after years, as it grew in grace and beauty, it was known far and wide, and people would come long journeys to see it. The only malorn west of the mountain and east of the sea, and one of the finest in the world. Altogether, 1420 in the Shire was a marvelous year. Not only was there wonderful sunshine and delicious rain in due times and perfect measure, but there seemed there seemed something more, an air of richness and growth and a gleam of beauty beyond that of mortal summers that flicker and pass upon this middle earth. All the children born or begotten in that year, and there were many, were fair to see and strong, and most of them had a rich golden hair that had before been rare among hobbits. The fruit was so plentiful and young, that young hobbits were nearly bathed in strawberries and cream, and later, later they sat on the lawns under the plum trees and ate until they had made piles of stones like small pyramids or the heaped skulls of a conqueror, and then they moved on. And no one was ill, and everyone was pleased except those who had to mow the grass. In the south farthing, the vines were laden, and the yield of leaf was astonishing. And everywhere there was so much corn that at harvest every barn was stuffed. The north farthing barley was so fine that the beer of 1420 malt was long remembered and become 
became a byword. Indeed, a generation later, one might hear an old gaffer and in, in, and in and in after a good pint of well-earned ale, put down his mug with a sigh. Ah, that was a proper 1420, that was. Sam stayed at first at the cottons with Frodo, but when the new row was ready, he went with the gaffer. In addition to all his other labors, he was busy re- directing the cleaning up and restoring the bag end, but he was often away in the shire on his forestry work, so he was not home at home in early March and did not know that Frodo had been ill. On the 13th of the month, Farmer Cotton found Frodo lying in his bed. He was clutching a white gem that hung on a chain above his neck, and he seemed half in a dream. It is gone forever, he said, and now all is dark and empty. But the fit passed, and when Sam got back on the 25th, Frodo had recovered, and he said nothing about himself. In the meanwhile, Bag End had been set in order, and Mary and Pippin came over from Crick Hollow, bringing back all the old furniture and gear so that the old hall soon looked very much as it always had done. When all was at last ready, Frodo said, When are you going to move in and join me, Sam? Sam looked a bit awkward. There is no need to come yet if you don't want to, said Frodo, but you know the gaffer is close at hand and he will be very well looked after by Widow Rumble. It's not that, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, and he went very red. Well, what is it? It's Rosie, Rose Cotton, said Sam. It seems she didn't like my going abroad at all, poor lass. But as I hadn't spoken, she couldn't say so, and I didn't speak because I had my own job to do first. I had a job to do first, but now I have spoken. And she says, well, you've wasted a year, so why wait longer? Wasted, I says. I wouldn't call it that. Still, I see what she means. I feel torn in two, as you might say. I see, said Frodo. You want to get married, and yet you want to live with me in Bag End, too. But my dear Sam, how easy. First married as soon as you can, and then move in with Rosie. There's room enough in Bag End for as big a family as you could wish for. And so it was settled. Sam Gamgee married Rose Cotton in the spring of 1420, which was also famous for its weddings. And they came and lived at Bag End. And if Sam thought himself lucky, Frodo knew that he was more lucky himself, for there was not a hobbit in the Shire that was looked after with such care. When the labors of repair had all been planned and set going, he took to a quiet life, writing a great deal and going through all his notes. He resigned the office of deputy mayor at the free fair that midsummer, and dear old Will Whitfoot had another seven years of presiding at banquets. Mary and Pippin lived together for some time at Kirk Hollow, and there was much coming and going between Buckland and Bag End. The two young travelers cut a great dash in the Shire with their songs and their tales and their finery and their wonderful parties. Lordly folk called them, meaning nothing but good, for it warmed all hearts to see them go riding by with their mail shirts so bright and their shields so splendid, laughing and singing songs of far away. And if they were now large and magnificent, they were unchanged otherwise, unless they were indeed more fair-spoken and more jovial and full of merriment than ever before. Frodo and Sam, however, went back to ordinary attire, except when that except that when there was need, they both wore long gray cloaks, finely woven and clasped at the throat with beautiful brooches, brooches. And Mr. Frodo wore always a white jewel on a white chain that he often would finger. All things that went well, with hope always of becoming still better, and Sam was as busy as a, as full of delight as even a hobbit would wish. Nothing for him marred that whole year except for some vague anxiety about his master, Frodo dropped quietly out of all doings of the Shire, and Sam was pained to notice how little honor he had in his own country. Few people knew or wanted to know about his deeds and adventures. Their admiration and respect were given mostly to Mr. Meriadoc and Mr. Peregrine, and if Sam had known to it, known it to himself. Also in the autumn, there, were, there appeared a shadow of old troubles. One evening, Sam came into the study and found his master looking very strange. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed to see see things far away. What's the matter, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. I am wounded, he answered. 
wounded. It will never really heal. But then he got up and the turn seemed to pass and he was quite himself the next day. It was not until afterwards that Sam recalled the date was October the 6th. Two years before on that day, it was dark in the Dell under weather top. Time went on and 1422 came in. Frodo was ill again in March. With great effort, he concealed it. And Sam had other things to think about. The first of Sam and Rosie's children was born on the 25th of March, a date that Sam noted. Well, Mr. Frodo, he said, I'm in a bit of a fix. Rose and me had settled to call him Frodo with your leave, but it's not him, it's her. Though as pretty a maid child as anyone would hope for, taking after Rose more than me, luckily. So he, so we don't know what to do. Well, Sam, said Frodo, what's wrong with the old customs? Choose a flower name like Rose. Half the maid children in the Shire are called by such names. And what would be better? I suppose you're right, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. I've heard some beautiful names on my travels, but I suppose they're a bit too grand for daily wear and tear, as you might say. The gaffer, he says, make it short, and then you won't have to cut it short before you can use it. But if it's to be a flower name, then I don't trouble about the length. It must be a beautiful flower because you see, I think she's very beautiful and is going to be beautifuler still. Frodo thought for a moment, well, Sam, what about Eleanor, the sun star? You remember the little golden flower in the grass of Lotharian? You're right again, Mr. Frodo, Sam delighted, said Sam delighted. That's what I wanted. Little Eleanor was nearly six months old and 1421 had passed into its autumn when Frodo called Sam into the study. It will be Bilbo's birthday on Thursday, Sam, he said, and he will pass the old took. He will be 131. So he will, said Sam. He's a marvel. Well, Sam, said Frodo, I want you to see Rose and find out if she can spare you so that you and I can go off together. You can't go far for a long time now, of course, he said a little wistfully. Well, not very well, Mr. Frodo. Of course not, but never mind. You can see me on my way. Tell Rose that you won't be away very long, not more than a fortnight, and you'll come back quite safe. I wish I could go all the way with you to Rivendell, Mr. Frodo, and see Mr. Lubo, said Sam. And yet the only place I really want to be is here. I am that torn in two. Poor Sam, it will feel like that, I'm afraid, said Frodo, but you will be healed. You were meant to be solid and whole, and you will be. In the next day or two, Frodo went through his papers and his writings with Sam, and he handed over his keys. There was a big book with plain red leather covers. Its tall pages were now almost filled. At the beginning, there were many leaves covered with Bilbo's thin, wandering hand, but most of it was written in Frodo's firm, flowing script. It was divided into chapters, but chapter 80 was unfinished, and after that were some blank leaves. The title page had many titles on it, crossed out one after another. So my diary, my, my expected journey, there and back again, and what happened after. Adventures of Five Hobbits, the tale of the Great Ring, compiled by Bilbo Baggins from his own observations and the accounts of his friends, what, he did, what we did in the War of the Ring. Here, Bilbo's hand ended and Frodo had written, the downfall fall of the Lord of the Rings and the return of the king. As seen in the little people, being the memoirs of Bilbo and Frodo and the Shire, supplemented by the accounts of their friends and the learning of the wise, together with extracts from books of lore translated by Bilbo and Rivendell. Why, you have nearly finished it, Mr. Frodo, Sam exclaimed. Well, you have kept at it, I must say. I have quite finished, Sam, said Frodo. The last pages are for you. On September the 21st, they set out together, Frodo on the pony that had borne him all the way from Minas Tirith and was now called Strider, and Sam on his beloved Bill. It was a fair golden morning, and Sam did not ask where they were going. He thought he could guess. They took the stock road over the hills and went towards the woody end, and they let their ponies walk at their leisure. They camped in the green hills, and on September the 22nd, they rode gently down into the beginning of the trees as afterward, afternoon was wearing away. If that isn't the very tree you hid behind when the black rider first showed up, Mr. Frodo, said Sam, pointing to the left. It seems like a dream now. It was evening and the stars were glimmering in the eastern sky. They passed the ruined oak and turned and went on down the hill 
between the hazel thickets. Sam was silent, deep in his memories. Presently, he became aware that Frodo was singing softly to himself, singing the old walking song, but the words were not quite the same. Still around the corner, they may wait, a new road or a secret gate, and though I oft have passed them by, a day will come at last when I shall take the hidden paths that run west of the moon, east of the sun. And as if in answer from down below, coming up the road, out of the valley, voices sang, Ah, Elbereth, Kilthonia, Silvery and Penel, Mariel, O Penel, Aler, Nath, Kilthonia, Ah, Elbereth. We still remember, we who dwell in this far land beneath the trees, the starlight on the western seas. Frodo and Sam halted and sat silent in the soft shadows until they saw a shimmer of the, as the travelers came towards them. There was Gildor and many fair elven folk, and there, to Sam's wonder, rode Elrond and Galadriel. Elrond wore a mantle of gray and had a star upon his forehead and a silver harp in his hand, and upon his finger was a ring of gold with a great blue stone, Vilia, mightiest of the three. But Galadriel sat upon a white palf palfrey and was ro robed all in glimmering white, like clouds above about the moon, for she herself seemed to shine with a soft light. On her finger was Nenya, the ring wrought of mithril that bore a single white stone flickering with a frosty star, riding slowly behind on a small pony and seeming to nod in his sleep was Bilbo himself. Elrond greeted him gravely and graciously, and Galadriel smiled upon them, well, Master Samwise, she said, I hear and see that you have used my gift well. The Shire shall now be more than ever blessed and beloved. Sam bowed, but found nothing to say. He had forgotten how beautiful the lady was. Then Bilbo woke up and opened his eyes. Hello, Frodo, he said. Well, I have passed the old took today, so that's settled. Now I think I'm quite ready to go on another journey. Are you coming? Yes, I am coming, said Frodo. The rain bears should, should go together. Where are you going, master? cried Sam, though at last he understood what was happening. To the haven, Sam, said Frodo, and I can't come. So, Sam, not yet anyway, not further than the havens, though you too were a rain bearer, if only for a little while. Your time may come, but not be too sad. Do not be too sad, Sam. You cannot be always torn in two. You will have to be one and whole for many years. You have so much to enjoy and to be and to do. But, said Sam, and tears started in his eyes, I thought you were going to enjoy the Shire too for years and years after all you have done. So I thought too once, but I have been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam, when things are in danger. danger some someone has to give up, give them up, lose them so that others may keep them. But you are my heir. All that I had and might have had, I leave to you. And also you have Rose and Eleanor and Frodo lad will come and Rosie lass and Mary and Goldilocks and Pippin and perhaps more than I cannot see. Your hands and your wits will be needed everywhere. You will be the mayor, of course, as long as you want to be and the most famous gardener in history and you will read things out of the Red Book, and keep alive the memory of the age that is gone, so that people will remember the great danger, and so love their beloved land all the more. And that will keep you as busy and as happy as anyone can be, as long as your part of the story goes on. Come now, ride with me. Then Elrond and Galadriel rode on, for the third age was over, and the days of the rings were past. And an end was come of the story and song of those times. With them went many elves of the high kindred who would no longer stay in Middle Earth. And among them, filled with a sadness that was yet blessed and without bitterness, rode Sam and Frodo and Bilbo and the elves delighted to honor them. Though they rode through the mist of the Shire all the evening and all the night, none saw them pass, save the wild creatures, or here and there some wonder in the dark, who saw a swift shimmer under the trees or a light and shadow flowing through the grass as the moon went westward 
And then, and when they had passed from the Shire, going about the south skirts of the White Downs, they came to the Far Downs, to the towers, and looked at the distant sea. And so they rode down at, at last to Mithlond, to the Grey Havens in the long Firth of Loon. As they came to the gates, Sidran, the shipwright, came, for, came forth to meet them, to greet them. Very tall he was, and his beard was long, and he was gray and old, save that his eyes were keen as stars. And he looked at them and bowed and said, All is now ready. Then Sirgren led him to the havens, and there was a white ship lying, and upon the quay, beside a, gray, a great gray horse, stood a figure robed all in white awaiting them. As he turned and came towards them, Frodo saw that Gandalf now wore openly on his hand the third ring, Narya the Great, and the stone upon it was red as fire. Then those who were to go were glad, for they knew that Gandalf also would take ship with them. But Sam was now sorrowful at heart, and it seemed to him that if the parting would be bitter, more g grievous still would be the long road home alone. But even as they stood there, and the elves were going aboard, and all was being made ready to depart. Up rode Mary and Pippin in great haste, and amid their tears, Pippin laughed. You tried to give us a slip once before and failed, Frodo, he said. This time you have nearly succeeded, succeeded, but you have failed again. It was not Sam, though, that gave you away this time, but Gandalf himself. Yes, and said Gandalf, for all... For it will be better to ride back three together than, all, than one alone. We are here at last, dear friends, on the shores of the sea comes the end of our fellowship in Middle Earth. Go in peace. I will not say, do not weep, for not all tears are an evil. Then Frodo kissed Mary and Pippin, and last of all Sam, and went aboard. And the sails were drawn up, and the wind blew, and slowly the ship fl slipped away down the long gray firth, and the light of the glass of Galadriel that Frodo bore glimmered and was lost, and the ship went out into the high sea and passed on into the west, until at last on a night of rain Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of singing that came across the water, and then it seemed to him that as his dream in the house of Bombadil, the gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores, and beyond them, a far green country under a swift sunrise. But to Sam, the evening deepened to darkness as he stood at the haven, and as he looked at the gray sea, he saw only a shadow on the waters that was soon lost in the west. There still, there still he stood, far away into the night, hearing only the sigh and murmur of the waves on the shores of Middle Earth. And the sound of them sank deep into his heart. Beside him stood Mary and Pippin, and they were silent. At last, the three companions turned away, and never again, looking back, they rolled slowly homewards. And they spoke no word to one another until they came back to the Shire. But each had great comfort in his friends on the long gray road. At last, they rode over the downs and took the east road. And then Mary and Pippin rode on to Buckland. And already they were singing again as they went. But Sam turned to Bywater and so came back up the hill as day was ending once more. And he went on and there was yellow light and fire within. And the evening meal was ready and he was expected. And Rose drew him in and set him in his chair and put little Eleanor upon his lap. He drew a deep breath. Well, I am back, he said. Thank you for tuning in. We will be taking a short break the rest of this week as we gear up for our next book. Join us again on Monday, whenever you normally find your podcast, for the beginning of our new adventure in The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. Good night, Flagstaff.